Hello and welcome to the All Flyers. Do you agree with me that the American Lockheed P-38 Lightning and the British DH-98 to have on Mosquito are two of the most beautiful aircraft ever built? The Wooden Wonder, the Mosquito, was largely built of wood due to World War II shortages of metal. Of 7,781 that were built, few have survived. The only flying example restored by Avspecs of New Zealand. The animal glues used to bond the balsa and birch wood deteriorated over time. No such problem for the P-38, which was built of metal. The Lockheed P-38 was designed in the late 1930s by Kelly Johnson and Hal Hibbard's team. Their engineering team became known as Skunk Works due to their location close to a smelly factory. Kelly's 14 rules they live by are still used today. They considered a range of twin engine configurations, including both engines in a central fuselage with push-pull propellers. Their eventual configuration was unusual, later seen on the Dutch Fokker G heavy fighter, Northrop P-61 Black Widow night fighter and Saab 21. The P-38 was not a small single engine fighter like the Spitfire. The two engines of the P-38 gave it built-in redundancy the counter-rotating propellers exhibiting no torque, so no trim adjustments with use of throttle. Like most twin-engine aircraft, failure of one engine required instant reaction to avoid a wing over. The prototype XP-38 cost US $163,000, though Lockheed had spent five times that much to get to that stage. It first flew in January 1939. The aircraft featured smooth butt jointed metal skins, flush riveting and all metal control surfaces. This was the first American truly modern military aircraft and the first fighter to top 400 miles per hour in level flight. Power came from two 1000 horsepower turbo supercharged 12 cylinder Ellison V1710 engines. The turbo superchargers muffled noise from the exhaust. The distinctive twin boom shape made it instantly recognizable to enemy fighters. The Germans nicknamed it the twin-tailed devil. World War II aces Richard Bong and Tom McGuire both flew P-38s. The P-38 was the first American long-range fighter with a range of 2,000 miles. Mounting the P-38 was challenging as shown here. Long before the P-51 came along, the P-38 could fly 2,000 miles. It was genuinely America's first long-range fighter. But for pilots to fly it, you had to climb up this small boarding ladder, a unique feature of the P-38. Took a little time to get used to, but with the left foot in the first go, pulling the handle here, putting the right foot into this stirrup, up here, and then there's a handhold, up, push the release button, and it's stowed. The P-38 first entered combat in 1942 in the Aleutian Islands. Tricycle landing gear made the landings and takeoffs easier and safer for pilots. The guns didn't converge, so whether a target was 10 metres in front or 300 metres away, it didn't matter. The late Jeff Ethel's documentary on flying the P-38 is a must watch. In its aerial reconnaissance role, the P-38 accounted for 90% of American aerial film captured over Europe. The P-38 was used most successfully in the Pacific and China, Burma, India theaters of operations as the primary long range fighter until the introduction of large numbers of P-51D Mustangs towards the end of the war. The P-38 slow rate of roll was later fixed by the introduction of hydraulic boosted ailerons. P-38 was able to approach the sound barrier in a dive leading to control lock. It wasn't until November 1941 that tests involving servo tabs on the elevator were tried to multiply the pilot's force. This led to test pilot Ralph Verdon's death when the tail came off. The P-38's dive problem was revealed to be the center of pressure moving back towards the tail when in high-speed airflow. The solution was to change the geometry of the wing's lower surface when diving to keep lift within the bounds of the top of the wing. It was so streamlined it had problems with compressibility. 
going so fast in a dive the controls would become unmovable due to what would later be known as near transonic shock waves moving back across the wings and tail, trapping the ailerons and elevators in an aerial vise. Not until late in the war did production versions have dive recovery flaps under the wings to prevent this problem. This was achieved with quick acting dive flaps. Kelly Johnson later recalled, I broke an ulcer over compressibility on the P-38 because we flew into a speed range where no one had been before. It was a fundamental physical problem. We saw compressibility as a brick wall for a long time." End of quote. Another issue to overcome was to convince pilots not to increase power on an engine when the other had failed. They had been taught to do the opposite. Increasing power in the P-38 would lead to a yawing rollover. Reducing power, then increasing gradually, was essential. It was the British who named the P-38 the Lightning. Lockheed had chosen the name Atalanta after the swift-running Greek goddess. It would seem that the pilot flying the Lightning was the determining factor in the P-38 success during a mission. German General Adolf Galland was unimpressed with the P-38, declaring it had similar shortcomings in combat to our BF-110. Our fighters were clearly superior to it." End of quote. Lieutenant General Jimmy Doolittle, commander of the 8th Air Force, chose to pilot a P-38 during the invasion of Normandy so he could watch the progress of the air offensive over France. He said, it was the sweetest flying plane in the sky." End of quote. After some disastrous raids in 1944 with B-17s escorted by P-38s and Republic P-47 Thunderbolts, Doolittle, then head of the US 8th Air Force, went to the Royal Aircraft Establishment Farnborough asking for an evaluation of the various American fighters. Test pilot Captain Eric Brown Fleet Air Arm recalled, we had found out that the BF-109 and Focke-Wulf-190 could fight up to Mark 0.75, three quarters the speed of sound. We checked the Lightning and it couldn't fly in combat faster than 0.68, so it was useless. We told Doolittle that all it was good for was photo reconnaissance and it had to be withdrawn from escort duties. And the funny thing is that the Americans had great difficulty understanding this because the Lightning had the top two aces in the Far East." End of quote. Far the most important that farmer in the war years was transonic testing. Now, you realize that a piston engine can never, aircraft can never go supersonic because of the drag of the propeller. But when you're fighting an enemy, you always want to have a margin of performance over their aircraft. And the idea was to get to as high a Mach number as possible. Now, Mach 1 is the speed of sound. So if you talk about Mach 0.75, that's three quarters of the speed of sound and so on. <clears throat> so it's all got to be below 1 if it's piston engine. Now, we had captured two German types of aircraft, fighter aircraft, that had landed inadvertently or um, crash landed in this country, namely the Focke Wolf 190 <coughs> and the Messerschmitt 109. And in our tests, we knew that these aircraft could fight at a max number of 0.75. Now that is called the tactical max number. The, Mach number at which you can fight, the maximum at which you can fight. There's a tactical Mach number and a critical Mach number. The critical Mach number is the one which is well beyond the tactical one, and it's the one at which, if you get that far, you have lost control of the aircraft. The Lockheed Lightning. Secondly, they have this aircraft, the P-47 Thunderbolt, and neither of these two were a success at all. Jimmy Doolittle, same one that was involved in this raid to Turkey, <clears throat> was then the boss of the fighter units in the United States Army Air Force. And he came to Farnborough 
And he said, I'm getting very disconcerting reports from the tail gunners in my fortresses <clears throat> that when the, these lightnings and thunderbolts, which were acting as top cover for the forts, flying 2,000 feet above them, so that if the forts were attacked, they could dive down on the enemy fighters at the advantage of height. And he said they're diving down towards the Germans, <clears throat> but just passing them and going straight on. That's the last we see them. They're disappearing into oblivion. Sad fact was they were making big holes in the ground in Germany. And what was going on? Why were they all <clears throat> disappearing like this? And he sent <clears throat> a lightning and a thunderbolt to Farnborough, and we tested them out. Had a tactical Mac number of 0.68. Useless. The Thunderbolt had a tactical Mac number of 0.71. Again, useless. And we had to tell these sad facts to the Americans. So there we are, Doolittle realized that neither of his fighters were any good. The Thunderbolt was very good at ground attack, and they, they was withdrawn into that role. They withdrew the lightnings from this escort duty and put them on reconnaissance work. Now, you may wonder at this because the lightning distinguished itself in the Far East. Indeed, the top two American aces in the whole war were flying lightnings in the Far East. What was the difference? The difference was as simple as this. The fight in Europe was taking place at 30,000 feet. The fight in the Far East never got much above 15,000. So, because it was mainly a carrier battery. So that is the big difference. The P-38 figured in one of the most significant operations in the Pacific Theatre, the interception on 18th of April 1943 of Admiral Yamamoto, the architect of Japan's naval strategy in the Pacific, including the attack on Pearl Harbor. When American codebreakers found out that he was to fly to Bougainville Island to conduct a frontline inspection, 16 P-38G Lightnings were sent on a long-range fighter intercept mission, flying 435 miles from Guadalcanal at low height above the ocean to avoid detection. The Lightnings met Yamamoto's two Mitsubishi G4M Betty fast bomber transports and six escorting Zeros just as they arrived at the island. The first Betty crashed in the jungle and the second ditched near the coast. The Americans lost one P-38. The end of the war left the USAAF with thousands of P-38s rendered obsolete by the jet age. The last P-38s in service with the United States Air Force were retired in 1949. Thank you for watching. Comments always welcome. Please like and subscribe to promote new content.